Mining the Word, staying true to Scripture while applying it to my everyday life. In the fall of 1990, I was at Andrews University, and to help pay for my room and board, I worked in the housing department for the apartments for students, married student housing. One day, I had a job where I had to go down to the Maplewood Apartments, and I entered the apartment, and they had some Venetian blinds that didn't work right, so I took them off the place, off their mount, and repaired the string inside, reworked it through, so it worked. And then there was a place where the linoleum had curled up and it needed to be re-glued to the floor. So I glued it back onto the floor, and finally I took the can of this glue and sealed it up shut, and I was cleaning up everything, getting ready to go, throwing all the trash into the wastebasket, and I couldn't find my key. I thought, what on earth happened to this master key that lets us into every apartment in Maplewood, Beechwood, and Garland apartments? It's an incredibly important master key. And way back then in 1990, if we lost one of those, they'd charge us $50, which for me was quite a bit of money back then. But more than the $50, I was concerned about my liability. If someone should find that key, if I lost it somewhere where someone else picked it up, that person could open any door in any of these apartments, and I was really concerned about that. And among other things, my own apartment was there in Beechwood at the time. Somebody could have just unlocked my door and walked right in. So I looked again at all these places I had been. I took the blinds back down, looked, no, the key didn't drop in there. I patted on the floor to feel, did it somehow get stuck, glued down into the space between the linoleum and the cement. No, it wasn't there. And so I even emptied the wastebasket out and put things back in one by one by one, and no, it wasn't there either. And I thought, where is that key? Well, today we're going to take a look at something that's a little bit like that, because I had unfinished business that day when I left. In fact, I actually borrowed another master key and looked in the apartment again. All those same places, the blinds, the linoleum, the wastebasket, still no key. And I prayed about it, and still no key. I had unfinished business. But then, after a few weeks went by, I think in answer to my prayers, all of a sudden an image popped into my brain. And I got one of the other master keys, and I went down to the shop where we kept all our tools, and I got out a screwdriver and opened that can of glue and I reached the screwdriver all the way down to the bottom and dug and what should come up? That key. Because in my mind was that lost image of that key sinking slowly through the viscous syrupy solids of that glue can. And there it was. That gave me something to be thankful about before Thanksgiving rolled around a couple weeks later. What a treat to not have to worry about where that thing was. Well, last time we were taking a look at Judah as he was begging, he didn't know it's his brother Joseph, he's begging the governor of Egypt, I became surety for Benjamin, please let me stay instead of him. And we saw how that was only possible because of his repentance, Judah's repentance some years earlier. And that incredible story, I hope you, you go back and look at it sometime, was in the message from uh, last year, or even the year before, called The Finger Points Back. But before we continue, let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for the privilege we have of being your servants, your children on this earth. Please guide us as we go through this passage of Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Come with me to Genesis chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He couldn't restrain himself anymore. That little piece of a sentence there, it tells me the purpose of that stuff that happened before. It could have made some people think, oh, he's getting revenge. But as we read chapter 45, finally, we get to see the heart of Joseph. All along, he cared about these brothers that it looked like he was tormenting. And it's being all bottled up inside, and we begin to see he's actually been testing them. 
he's trying to see if their conversion was genuine. And we noticed the results of that as we had in the last few messages about how they had the privilege of proving we are different. We are good men now. We are no longer cruel and indifferent and intolerant. Verse 2, And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. There you see his heart. He's weeping so loudly that people hear him down in these adjacent or not so distant buildings. Now as we go through these next verses, I'm going to hopscotch a bit and ask you, notice the specific words, and they tell us something about Joseph. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Is my father still alive? Way back in Genesis 43, verse 27, what had he called that same man? Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? We've gone from your father to my father. What's going on here? Notice these next verses say the same thing. I am Joseph. Does my father still live? Verse 9, go up to my father. Verse 13, tell my father of all my glory. Bring my father down here. But now we take a look at another person's words. Verse 17, Pharaoh said to Joseph, bring your father and your households. Verse 19, bring your father and come. So now we jump back to Joseph's words in verse 23. So Joseph sent to his father these things. The last part of the verse, they were for his father for the journey. But then there's a turn in verse 25. Then they went out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. So here we've had it. We've seen Joseph say, my father and my father and my father, then Pharaoh will say, well, it's your father. And finally, when we get to the end of the chapter, it's their father. I don't want to miss something that I think is a pretty pivotal part of this chapter. Moses takes the perspective of different people in the story. And so we get to see three different perspectives here. We get to see the perspective of Joseph. And let's look at what it says when it's seen from his perspective about my father. And we'll see the, briefly the perspective of Pharaoh as he says, your father. And then very briefly at the end, we see the perspective of these 10 brothers as they go down to their father. But as we get to these parts, we'll unpack it a little more. So let's go back to verse 3. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Yeah, I think I would have had a hard time answering too. Can you imagine all the thoughts that crowded into their minds at this time? They must have been thinking, how can this be? Way back when we thought he, he had died, we thought that as we sold him into slavery, that was the end forever. And now they're stunned and their minds must have raced ahead to, how will we ever explain this to father? Verse 4, And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Here it is. He's first acknowledging, You sold me into Egypt. You chose bad things for me. But he immediately transitions to what happened. Verse 5, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. What a statement. Joseph had that capacity in his prophetic insight, the way he could look right through stuff other people missed, and he could see, you sent me here for some bad reasons, but when you thought you were sending me here in reality, God was sending me here. And I stop and I think, how many times in my life am I able to look back and say, those bad things that happened actually were for the purpose of bringing out some good. God lined those things up as part of your experience. Maybe they're to change me, change people around me, to provide some opportunity for someone around me. But I want to have that capacity of Joseph to recognize, even though you think you harmed me this way, God was behind it all the time. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. That must have been so fascinating for the brothers to hear. What? There are two years and there are five more? How do you know? How can this be? They were beginning to get insight into this other piece of their brother, their brother 
the prophet. Can you imagine having a family member that was a prophet? I've often thought what it must be like to be married to a prophet. And you know, you have a disagreement or something and you could get counsel from the Lord as an insight through your spouse. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Here he's seriously underlining the reality. God sent me here to save you. And then he comes to underline this with an extremely powerful statement in verse 8. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Wait a minute. Did you catch that one little piece? I'll chase a rabbit just for a minute. Joseph says, as he's speaking probably in Hebrew to his brothers, he's using a Hebrew way of thinking, he said that God has made me a father to Pharaoh. He might have even been born later than Pharaoh. Who knows? But he says, God made me a father to Pharaoh. In a similar way, when it says that Jesus is the Son of God, it doesn't necessarily mean that he existed later than God the Father. These terms, Father and Son, sometimes show a relationship that would have some other kind of meaning to us. So Joseph starts with letting them know the dreams came true. Way back in chapter 37, they had heard about sheaves bowing to his sheaf and sun, moon, and stars bowing to him. And nobody understood what that was all about. But now they could see God really had a plan from way back then until now. He dreamed it. He lived it. And so that could give them confidence in his ex explanation about two years of bad stuff done and five more coming. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. There is he saying, my father, you're going to say to my father, this is Joseph's perspective. He's been torn away from his father. He wants to have his father be relieved of the agony of thinking this son has predeceased him. He wants, even though he knows it's going to be a terrible task for his brothers, he wants father to be able to know the truth. So now we see Joseph's perspective, and we'll get some hints at the other side as, as some time goes on. But included in this perspective about his father, notice what it said? God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. Sometimes it's hard to persuade a parent to live with a child, and sometimes it's actually better for the parent not to live with a child, to live somewhere else. But Joseph, he could show conclusively, it's going to be better here in Egypt, at least for a while. And so he says, See, uh, say this to my father. He continues telling his father, You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. Can you imagine this message coming to Jacob's ears not so long later? And as he would realize the dream came through true, Joseph dreamed that he would have people bowing to him. That happened. And now he's telling me there are five more years of famine. That's going to happen too. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. Here in the middle of all this, apparently Joseph noticed his brothers just kind of almost dazed, thinking, how are we supposed to say this? How are we supposed to know that you really are our brother Joseph? It's like when the phone rings and somebody's saying, I'm from AT&T, or I'm from this uh, auto warranty place, or, you know, whatever they're saying, and you're thinking, yeah, right, you're just trying to steal my identity, or get me to reveal some information that will let you access funds, we wonder, how do I know you're genuine? And Joseph, he, he used this as the way that they could know. You see me with your own eyes. Look, Benjamin can see me. Now before this, all they knew is they're looking at Zephnath Paniah, the governor of all this land who speaks Egyptian, whatever the Egyptian language was. And all of a sudden, they hear him now probably speaking Hebrew, which might be a little sloppy since he's been gone so long, more than 20 years. But as he was speaking it, they could hear, wait, that sounds familiar. And they could look again. You do have the facial features of our brother Joseph now that we look more carefully. And Benjamin could look, and they could both look at Benjamin and Joseph and see, you know, where they had the same mom and dad. Probably they had some resemblance. 
So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Again, he says, my father, because it's his perspective. I want you to reach out to this man that's so precious to me. All this time I've been testing you and using all this all these methods of having you not see that I'm actually your brother. But now that you know I'm your brother, he's my father too. I want to care for my father. Just like Judah was trying to care for his father, saying, let me bear the blame. I'm the guarantee. And now Joseph is showing, well, I want to care for him too. I'm actually not here to hurt him. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. There you see his heart. He's weeping and the sounds are getting louder. as He's letting them know, I've missed you. But it wasn't only Benjamin. They might have thought, look, you two are born from the same mother and you'll love each other, but you're going to be out to hurt us. No. Verse 15, moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. They were shell-shocked, I think, before. They were afraid. And now that he's been holding them, hugging them, weeping on their shoulders, they realize, you care about us. You're not here for revenge. And he's told them, look, don't blame yourselves. You did what you did, but God meant it to bring about salvation for all of us. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. What a blessing. This one who helped save Egypt from the destruction of the famine, his family now has come. And the Pharaoh was so pleased about that, he wanted to do something. And thankfully, this gives Joseph a way to actually help his father. Imagine if Joseph just said, hey, you come down, I'll put you in a good place. The others would look on and they'd be jealous and they'd think, look, you are using your authority to make your people have advantage. So Joseph avoided that problem when the king found out, your family's coming? I myself offer you the best of the land. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this, load your animals and depart, go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of the land of Egypt is yours. So there it was. They didn't have to worry about how are we going to make this work. He offered them the best, and they'd even have ox carts to bring it in. They wouldn't have to load it on those poor little donkeys that could hardly carry enough food, let alone food and stuff to move and all that. Then the sons of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them carts, according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. But Joseph didn't stop with helping them move. Think back, way back to chapter 37, when they sold him as a slave. What did they do? They ripped away his special clothes, the coat of many colors. And now, more than 20 years later, Joseph gives them special clothes. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. It's plural with the garments for the brothers, so it's more than one change of clothes. But there's something more for Benjamin, and it's still kind of an ongoing test. He can see, are they jealous as he gives more to the son of his own mother? Well, no, they're good men now, even though Joseph is pushing it probably a bit too far by this favoritism. They're not going to let that get to them. And he sent to his father these things, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. So he's sending enough not just to live on for a little bit there, but enough to live on while traveling to Egypt. He was caring for his people. But it wasn't just a matter of move here and a matter of here's stuff to sustain you and a matter of you took away my special clothes and I'm giving you special clothes. There's even an additional layer. Verse 24, so he sent his brothers away and they departed and he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. Here in my Hebrew Bible it says, al tirkazu. The tirkazu from rachaz. Rachaz is to kind of shake, agitate. And when it comes to 
stuff between people, it's to be, as we, even we would say, to be agitated or shaken or troubled. And he, Joseph's recognizing as you're going back, he had overheard them talking. And Reuben, remember when they all were in prison and Reuben was saying, oh, didn't I tell you that you shouldn't harm the lad? And, you know, he heard this discussion and he thought, after all this, they're on the long journey home with some unfinished business. And they may start arguing, well, it's your fault. You told, you know, Judah, you said that we should sell him. Hey, Reuben, where were you when we were doing this? You walked off. We can blame you. You know, and he thought, let's not have the arguing. Don't argue. You sent me here. But actually, God sent me here, remember? Don't be arguing on the way. So you can imagine them there with the donkeys and the carts and all this other stuff. And as they're getting closer and closer and closer to home, there must have been one thing weighing on their minds. Verse 25, Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. There we saw it, their father. The story turns now to the perspective of the brothers. And as they're getting closer, I'm quite sure that they would have been thinking, oh, what do we do now? We have some of the most exciting news that you could ever imagine. Joseph is alive. He's the ruler in Egypt. But if we explain this, we have to admit that we lied to father. We deceived him and made him think Joseph died. But Joseph's alive. How are we going to do this? So as they faced the uncertainty of that arrival at Jacob's tent, they had unfinished business. And finally, they had to look into his eyes. And it, it must have been really challenging. How are we going to share good news, which is also painful news for us? Mercifully, Moses does not expose them and reveal the details of their confessing to their deception, confessing to the treacherous act of throwing their brother in a pit, the treacher treacherous act of selling him as a slave, such a horrible thing. But obviously they would have to have said that kind of stuff. And Jacob's heart must have been broken a new time. But notice, when first they brought that bloody garment, he believed a lie. And now when they bring all this good news, he disbelieves the truth. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. So we move from the belief in the lie in chapter 38 to the disbelief or doubt of the truth in chapter 45. And they did the only thing they could, as we still see it from their perspective, they could point outside the door of the tent. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. It's still the perspective of the brothers, their father. And they had to see this horrible transition as it dawns on him. What have you done? What have you done to him? Why would I think that he's dead and he's actually governor in Egypt? And their confession, I believe, must have been genuine. Then Israel said, Wait a minute, what did it call him before? He was called Jacob, their father. Jacob, you know, the name Yaakov, the heel grabber, the deceiver, the supplanter. But now it transitions to his mighty, powerful name, Yisrael, the one who has power with God, the Yasar, the princely power, El, with Elohim, or God. Then Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. So as I see the way this story is written, whether in Hebrew or in English, there are three things that hit me as I look at this. And the first one is, I notice how through the use of these different perspectives, the perspective of Joseph, the perspective of Pharaoh, perspective of the brothers, there's a place that Moses implies, there's a place for us to put ourselves in other people's shoes. We need to pause and think, what would it be like if I were in that person's situation? And then we say or do what we need to say or do. But there's also a second thing that comes to mind. As I see the way Joseph talks to his brothers, I realize I need to acknowledge God's role in what's happening in my life. You see what Joseph said? You know, you 
sent me here, but actually God sent me here to preserve life. Don't just focus on what's going on between us, but try to understand how is God involved in this. But then as we get to the end of the chapter here, we see how Moses protects the privacy of these brothers after they came to explain, actually, we lied to you and we sold our brother as a slave and all that other ugly stuff. That's not even mentioned in the story. It's only implied. And in a similar way, there's a place for us to give privacy to others as we're dealing with the messy stuff and we're working with them or nudging them to take next steps. And so, before concluding, I want to just zero in on verse 7, which is such a powerful punch for this messy chapter. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph could see, yes, you think you sent me here, and you did, but actually, God did. Think back in your own life over some of the messy things that happened, the difficult or painful experiences, and pause to consider, is there a possibility that some of that stuff actually involved God's will? Of course, he didn't mean for you to suffer the ugliness, but is it possible that all along he was working through that to prepare you or prepare someone else for the next step? We're running out of time, not just in this message today, but we're running out of time here on this earth. And are we using that time to really make a positive difference in the lives of people around us? So I challenge you to begin looking for the way God is possibly using some of this messy stuff in your life to make a positive impact on other people. See how the negative things may have some positive outcome. And some of this you won't know for a while. As Joseph was dragged out of that pit and sold, he'd have to wait, what, 22 years before he could realize this is what God had in mind. But one day he would realize this is what God had in mind. And so in closing, I ask, what is your unfinished business? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for working through these brothers, not only to change them and make them to be good men, but to bring them to a place where they could see the effect of their forgiveness. They could see how you overruled what they did wrong. Please help us to have these opportunities somewhere, somehow, that we can see how you overruled what we did wrong and you made something good, and I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you continue mining the word. And I challenge you, look through the bad stuff and try to get just a glimmer of how God might be actually working through you to make a positive difference in the lives of others. God bless you.